I'm Don Miller, owner of Peninsular Farms. This farm is historically the oldest property in the state of Ohio. I've owned it since 1979. This farm has a lot of history. Uh, James Whitaker, the first white settler in the state of Ohio, is buried here on this farm. And uh, James came over on his uncle's ship when he was 12 years old from England and left his ship and came west on his own. He was captured by Wyandotte Indians and they brought him back here to what is now Fremont, made him run the gauntlet. And the gauntlet, for those that don't know, consists of two lines of braves, so-called braves, with clubs, knives, hatchets, whatnot. And then the poor guy was made to run through the gauntlet while they'd all swing on him and everything. <clears throat> he did it so bravely that instead of running him back through, the squall says he's a brave boy, he's my son, and she adopted him. And so he was raised as an Indian then. Uh, his wife, Elizabeth Fox, also came over from England and she was captured over near what is now Butler, Pennsylvania. She eventually ended up in this tribe and they married in captivity. Well, you know, the Wyandots gave them 1,200 acres and they established here a farm, a trading post and all. The British sailed up, Fort, up the Sandusky River and attacked Fort Stevenson and they were repulsed. And on their way back down, they burnt down the trading post of James Whitaker, their home and trading post and everything. And uh, when I bought the farm, I, I knew about the Battle of Fort Stevenson, but I didn't know about the British burning down James Whitaker's house. And I was doing a lot of business with a British company at that time. And uh, I got over there fairly frequently and they would also come over here. When I learned about the Brits burning down the trading post, I sent them a bill. And, and I, I demanded interest from 1812. And uh, so I had a lot of fun with that. And every time I'd talk with them on the phone or anything, I'd say, I'm waiting for your check. You haven't paid. You burned down my house. And uh, so uh, next time I went over to England, but Carolyn went with me and uh, they had all the directors and everything and they took us out to dinner and uh, wined us and dined us and everything and after dinner we, uh, the waiter brought a package and the chairman brought this package out and in that, in that they uh, had a plaque said, Don Miller has been giving us a bad time about how we burned down his house. And they said, we went to the British War Museum in London and found out there was a battle of Fort Stevenson, but it didn't say a thing about Don Miller's house. And uh, he said, however, in interest of peace with our American friend, we the directors of ALA Systems have agreed to pay Don Miller one gold sovereign minted in 1840 so there wouldn't be any more talk about interest and they gave me this gold sovereign and uh, I was kind of taken back and I said I'm embarrassed they said good <laughs> and anyway can you see that in the camera yeah and they got this gold sovereign minute in 1840, so there wouldn't be any more talk about interest. Nathan Goodale is buried right next to the Whitakers, and uh, he was a Revolutionary War soldier, and uh, the British, or the Indians rather, captured him, and they were taking him to Detroit for ransom and he got sick and today they think he probably had pneumonia 
But uh, anyway, they dropped him off with the Whitakers because they were as much Indian as they were white. And he died then, and they, they buried him there at the grave, which we will show. And there's a little sidelight to that story, too. Uh, the Goodale family, there was a, a lawyer out in Denver, Colorado that was doing a family history, and they never found out what happened to Nathan Goodale. And uh, so he called the, or wrote to the library here and wanted any information on this area. And they sent him a copy of the Toledo Blade, which showed me standing next to Nathan Goodale's grave. And consequently, he, he knew what happened to Nathan. And he came up here then to get more information because nobody in the Goodale family knew what ever happened to him. And as I said, the Indians were taking him down the, the river and they were gonna go to Detroit and get ransom and he became sick, and the Whitakers were as much Indian as white, and so they left him off with them. Over the years, the 1,280 acres got subdivided and sold off and so on. James Whitaker died. His wife lived here, and uh, in about 1830, the U.S. Congress codified this gift and made it official and Mrs. Whitaker took title and deed to the, the land then. Eventually it became just five small farms and uh, a man by the name of Mooney, J Joe Mooney from Detroit, bought these five farms and put them into one and named it Peninsula Farms. Reason being, if you went straight out, there's the river, of course, if you went straight back here, you'd be in the river again. The river circles and goes around the farm, and that's how he named it Peninsula Farms. Uh, he was an enthusiast of horses, racehorses, and so on, and he had uh, the world's number one harness horse here on this farm named Billy Direct, and uh, so he had a lot of championships, and he died in 1950, and his son, and I can't put this nicely, his son was a booze head, and he sold the horses, laid off all the men except one, and uh, had him farm, regular farming no more race horses or anything. And the son's name was Jack. He lived in Detroit. He'd come down here about two drunks a summer and spend some time in this house and, and go up to the yacht club and drink. And anyway, I lived on Port Clinton Road, which is right across the road from this farm. And I wanted this farm for the land. Uh, and uh, so once I convinced him that I wouldn't subdivide it and sell it off, he agreed to sell it to me. Ray Grobe knew the man personally and he took me up to Detroit and introduced me to him. And he, Ray helped me a whole lot and uh, buying this place. After I bought the farm, I was bombarded by people wanting to buy lots and, and develop it for me and all this and that. And I had already learned to love the farm and I wasn't about to sell off any parts of it. And uh, then I learned about being able to get a conservation easement on it. We love it. Uh, we went through Black Swamp Conservancy and got a conservation easement on it. And now it can never be developed, sold off, split up, or anything else. And uh, we have, Carolyn and I have rights to live here, of course, and which we are doing. 
when Jack Mooney, after he sold off the horses, let the farm run down, and I mean run down, it was in bad shape. Uh, this house was decent on the inside, a throwback to the 20s, but uh, it was decent. And uh, my youngest daughter, after I bought the farm, she said, Daddy, this is my last summer home. Let's go down there and live this summer. And I thought, yeah, that'll give me an idea if I ever want to build down there. So we, we moved down here and we spent the summer and I got bit and Larry and all my, my other kids came home from college. We spent the summer. Well, they went back to college and I batched it here that winter. And the uh, following year, following summer, they all lived here and then we started making plans to remodel it and live here. By that time I had been totally bit by the thing and I knew this is where I wanted to live. And so we're glad we did and Carolyn came in the picture about then and she helped me remodel this house, helped me design the remodeling of it. And when I leave this farm, it'll be when I know it.